So what matters more than latches is definitely registers. We're going to use them to create pipelines and to create shift registers that align signals. So here we see the entity and architecture of a one bit flip flop or shift register. And this is the uh, basic structure upon which we will build uh, all variations of, of uh, registers for use in ASICs and FPGAs. And so the entity, as you can see, has uh, three ports, two input ports, D and clock, and a single output port Q, which shouldn't come as any surprise. That's what a, uh, a flip-flop looks like, a single bit clock, a single bit D, and a single bit Q, all of type standard logic. Uh, the architecture is gonna include a single process, and that process is gonna have a single uh, uh, element in its sensitivity list which is the clock signal clock and so um, we see here that it contains only a single conditional statement if clock event and clock equals one then q is equal to d um, again as with the latches you see that there's no else which says that uh, else in the other cases uh, you should keep the old value of q by the way if you included an else statement here and you said else q is equal to q then that would give you the same result the synthesizer will understand what you want to do except in this case of course q is an output port and it will give you uh, an error but let's just assume that q was an internal signal then you can actually do that but you don't need to so without writing the else we understand that what you want to do else is preserve the old value but let's just consider the uh, condition here the condition consists of two parts both of which have to be true for the condition to be true one of them is clock equal to one which is uh, something we fully understand the clock is equal to one and the first includes uh, involves the use of an attribute so this is a predefined attribute called uh, the event attribute and if you go back and look at the attributes video you will understand that when we say clock and then call the attribute event that's going to be equal to true when there is an event on the signal and it's going to be false whenever there's no event on the signal an event is an actual change in the value of the signal. So it's not a transaction, it's not something that is scheduled to happen at the end of the process, it is an actual change in the signal. And so when you look at this clock uh, dash event, it's going to be true only when the clock goes high or when the clock goes low. So clock event is going to be true for two instances when the clock changes value high and low. and so when is the whole condition going to be true? When there's an event on the clock and that clock changes value, and after the change, the clock is equal to one, which only happens at the positive edge of the clock. And so this describes a positive edge triggered register or single bit flip-flop in this case, which uh, is going to register the value of D on Q when the value of the clock changes and becomes one, which is a positive edge. Now, uh, why does the sensitivity list not include D as well as clock? Because we don't need to include D. If you include D, that's fine. It's not gonna give you an error, and it's not gonna give you a warning, and it's not gonna change the synthesis outputs or simulation outputs, but you just don't need to include it. Why? Because if you include D, which would be the reasonable thing to do since it's on the right-hand side of an assignment, then you will call the process and cause it to execute every time D changes. But you don't need to do that because every time D changes, the process will not do anything unless this condition is true. So you only need to go and reprocess when this condition changes from true to false or from false to true, which only depends on clock. So you don't actually need to do that. When, when, when we were declaring latches, we actually had to include D in the sensitivity list because the condition was true for a very long time when clock was equal to one during the whole phase, the whole positive phase of the clock. But here, the condition is only true at an edge. And so you don't actually need to include D in the sensitivity list. Now let's look at some variations on the register. Uh, these are two variations that include enables. So we have uh, a register with enables. Uh, in this case, the enable, uh, condition is within the condition of the clock and in this case 
the enable condition, the enable if, is outside uh, the, con the clock condition. And so we call this a uh, synchronous enable, and we call this an asynchronous enable. So the asynchronous enable will change the in enable or disable of the register regardless of the clock. But the synchronous enable will change from enabling to disabling only on the edge of the clock. Notice that when we use a, uh, an asynchronous enable, we have to include the enable in the sensitivity list because a change in the value of enable must cause us to reprocess or reevaluate the process because if enable changes to zero, we have to go and reevaluate the process and block anything from happening. This is regardless of what the clock does. But if the enable condition is within the clock condition, we don't actually need to include enable in the sensitivity list because everything is masked by the clock signal. Right. Uh, notice that if enable is included in the uh, sensitivity list, we still need to include the clock in the sensitivity list because if enable is equal to one, then we still need to go and reevaluate the process whenever there's an event on the clock. And thus, clock has to be part of the sensitivity list. Similar to enables, we can also include resets. And what resets do is that they um, set the output of the register to zero. And so we can have a synchronous reset, in which case the reset is within the, the condition of the clock and doesn't exist in the sensitivity list. Or we can have an asynchronous reset, reset which is outside uh, the process, which is outside the condition of the clock and must be included in the sensitivity list. So you can have asynchronous reset, synchronous reset, asynchronous enable or synchronous enable. Uh, this is the most general way to declare a register, and you can um, you can use this as a standard way because it's safe and its synthesis results are predictable. And so um, you can see here that the uh, width of the input bus and the output bus uh, is a generic, which allows us to define it at instantiation time. And so this is a single uh, register which is declared uh, as an uh, as a design and can then be instantiated for a register of any length. And uh, you can see that the inputs and the outputs are defined in terms of the generic. It has a reset signal. And if you look here, then you'll see that the reset is asynchronous. So this is the most, uh, this is the safest and most standard way to declare a register. It is a register without an enable and with a, uh, an asynchronous reset. Why is this safe? Because this is the way most uh, design tools expect it to be. Uh, ASIC tools specifically recognize this uh, form and can replace it with a scan register, which is helpful in uh, design for testability. But also having a, um, an asynchronous reset is really useful because when we look at uh, state machines, you'll find that it's always favorable, it's always good to have a state to which you can go back when something goes wrong. And so that's always the reset state. It, it brings us back to a known state if the uh, design or the circuit has gone haywire. And the best way to do this is through an external global reset signal, which in this case has to be asynchronous. This allows us to even override anything that could have gone wrong with the clock, anything that could have gone wrong with the with the pipeline and just go to a known state. So always include a, a, an asynchronous reset. And I would advise that this asynchronous reset for all the registers be brought up to the highest level and they all should be connected to a single global asynchronous reset which comes from an external pin.